Hello everyone, welcome to this, this video presentation of my work. My name is Olivier Sorrentino, aka Ali Sorensen. I'm doing this YouTube video as a replacement for a live conference I was meant to deliver at the NAD Center, but because of the COVID pandemic, the conference was delayed and delayed for about a year now, and I'm not sure if it's ever going to happen, so I decided to do this video instead. In this video, I'll be giving out examples of the work I've been doing for the past 25 years or so. And as we move further on, I'll be showing some examples of other works by other remix artists. So to ease the flow of this presentation in the coming slides, we're going to see stills of individual pieces. Sometimes they're animations or installations. You can explore the individual pieces more in detail most of them from my website. Otherwise, I'll be putting up some links on the YouTube page down below. And I'll be doing the same for the other artists I'll be presenting a little bit later. One last thing before we move into the talk itself, I'm going to mention a few biographical notes. I was born in LA, in California. But at the time I started primary school, my family moved to Montreal in Canada, so this is also where I started my art career, so I'm very much a Canadian artist. All right, so in art school, I started out as a painter. My first encounter with remix art, we could bring it back all the way to when I was blending text and images. So these were the first works that I was recognized for doing. There's a series called uh, Word Pictures, which I produced between 1993 and 1998. And these started out somewhat as a uh, frustration in art school when we were always asked to talk about the work and I felt more often a desire to, to be doing the work, not necessarily talking about it all the time. And so my reaction to this uh, situation was to actually put the writing on the canvas instead of talking about the work separately from doing the work, the actual description of the work was on the paintings themselves. So this is one piece I produced during the um, painting symposium in Bay Saint Paul in 1996, so that's in Northern Quebec. It's entitled, as the text mentions, Ceci est un texte, which means this is a text. It's in reference pretty directly to René Magritte, the surrealist painter, in reference to the painting Ceci n'est pas une pipe, so he painted a pipe and wrote a text underneath saying, this is not a pipe. So obviously that's true because it's a picture of a pipe. It's a representation of a pipe and not the pipe itself. However, when we write text, the text on paper or on canvas uh, remains a text. It doesn't change its nature. So this was my central statement at the time, working with text, with language as a hybrid between abstraction and, and figuration in combination with making a reference to certain artists like Magritte. So these elements hinted at remix art even before I could uh, call it that way. Around the same time, I was given the opportunity for a solo exhibition in 1995, my first solo exhibition at Cartier Femin, which is run by the same people now running Foundry Darling in uh, Montreal. 1995 was an important year in world history because that was the year which commemorated the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. But the end of the Second World War isn't marked by a single event, but actually a sequence of individual events, uh, which started with the uh, Battle of Normandy in June in France, and we could say terminated with uh, the dropping of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombs in Japan towards August of 1945. And since my exhibition was in September 1995, so closer to the 50th anniversary of the dropping of the atomic bombs in Japan, I felt it was impossible for me not to commemorate this event in my art show. So here is the key work from uh, this show entitled Crux Dissimulata which means hidden cross in Latin, and that's the title of the entire show as well. And here I wanted to draw a direct correlation between the US and its enemy, uh, say uh, Nazi Germany, Japan. So there was an 
association I wanted to make between Nazi Germany killing millions of Jews in World War II and the imperialist America who dropped unnecessarily, I think, the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which also killed countless lives in the process. So another anecdote about this uh, piece, it was never shown in its integrity at Cartier Femer. It was censored because of its overtly political content. So on the right, you can see a glimpse of how it, it was actually shown. Only uh, one in two pieces was remaining. So you could barely see uh, the swastika anymore, made up of American flags. But in actuality, it was uh, much closer to its title, Crux Dissimilata, so the hidden cross. Here again we can see the blending of opposites, US flags to make a swastika and this is how you can see a, a practice which is getting closer and closer to remix art. Alright, another piece from the same exhibition is entitled Us and Them. It comprises a painted toy on a plinth, a toy that I played with as a child. And as I was planning this exhibition, I went to my parents' house uh, to tidy up some boxes of knickknacks, uh, old stuff that was still there at my parents' place. But only when I, I looked at it, this Native American figure with the exhibition in mind as I was preparing it, only then did I notice that the figure was almost posing in the shape of a swastika as well. So I had this um, epiphany to, to show it in my exhibition. Behind the plinth is written the title of the work. It can either uh, read as us and them or us and them. This nuance for me talked about the changing understanding of the First Nation as a child for me as playful adversaries when playing cowboy and Indians, for example. But then the framing changed my understanding of the colonial ideas and their place as others in the building of the American nation. Also with the previous piece in mind, you can understand the dramatic stories of First Nations of victims of a, another type of, of genocide, this time on American soil. A third and final piece of the same exhibition I'll show here entitled Right Guard. This is uh, composed of a billboard sized text with another plinth in the middle featuring another found object, this time seemingly benign deodorant stick. But again, within the context of this show, there's a more complex meaning that arises first in the militarist connotations of the word right and guard. And for good measure, the product also bears the strap line, no white residue, pure power. So maybe for some, it isn't hard also to read white power, to top it all off, you also look closely at the uh, silver running man at the bottom. You can see another hidden cross, uh, like half a swastika in the arms of the figure. Again, before even uh, practicing remix art, you can understand that I did already work with found object to enhance some of their meaning through juxtaposition or isolation. And particularly here, to unearth some of the um, embedded ideologies in everyday things as much as in uh, historical events. What I haven't said so far to avoid distracting from talking about the actual work is that when I was preparing the show Crux de Simulata, I also wanted to avoid confusing the audience between the word-based paintings I did before and the political works of Crux de Simulata. So the easiest solution for me was to adopt an artist name, which was signed therefore as Anonymous. This is a name that I made up from breaking down the word anonymous. And as you'll see in a minute, I'll be coming up with a few more artist names to sign my work to come. Net Persona was a web project, which also was made into a silkscreen. This was signed as Anonym which means also anonymous in French. Egonaut, an interactive video installation shown at the Montreal Museum of Contemporary Art. This was signed Annie One. And United States of Me was signed by Sid Ominous. This piece is by Yves Rib Audi called Les Abineufs de l'Empereur 
or in English, the Emperor's New Clothes. So you can see that the years between 1995 and 99 were very productive for me, but also as I altered my name over and over, a pattern gelled in the type of imagery I was making, which culminated with the uh, solo show at Copy Art Center, entitled Els Self, where I showed works from all of my alter egos. So in effect, I stage a collective exhibition all by myself. So this imagery had to do with the mixing up of physical features and of identities and in the use of digital media, uh, digital stills or animation, and also online. What I experienced was a greater distance between users and by extension in my art, I experienced a greater distance as an artist between myself and the audience. So this translated into a greater malleability of, of identities, my identity for me as a creator. And I thought the same was true for everyone else online as users. Over time, I realized this idea was really going against the, the grain of other artistic trends around the turn of the millennium, so around 2000. Increasingly, many art exhibitions and practices uh, were talking about fixed identities in contrast with increased mobilities which didn't make much sense to me so the idea of blackness of asianness for example uh, of ethnic diversity was very emerging in many art practices so there was an increase in global mobility that was being promoted in in art to be a successful artist around that time this is when it really became important to to not only show in your country or in your uh, community, but to exhibit around the world. But at the same time, artists needed to keep their own identity of where they came from and even address this in, in their art. So my work was much more about a mobility of identities as well. So a mixing up of identities. And it was contrary, let's say, to what was in fashion at the time. So the blending of cultures, the, um, the blending of identities, I really found that much more in, in a music culture. So this led me to go on a hiatus of, of art production. I moved to London and instead of uh, banging my head against, you know, the opposite direction that the art world was going, I spent roughly 10 years working in the music industry as a VJ as a video jockey. And this is really where I could fully articulate what the art of remixing was all about. So I quickly gained a reputation in the emerging VJ world. And I was even recognized by DJ Mag, the magazine behind the famous uh, annual top 100 DJ list. I was recognized in there among the top 10 VJs of the world between 2003 and 2008. And I did so many collaborations with the DJs during this time. I went on tour with uh, many of them, uh, often sharing the stage with them. Then I started doing my own AV performances, so audiovisual performances, mixing the music as well as the video animation at the same time in front of a live audience. This was often done with a laptop, but also just with uh, live mixing videos and sound on pre-recorded DVDs on units like the uh, Pioneer DVJX1. These were units especially designed for AV performance in mind. So for example, this is a DVD I produced in collaboration with the uh, Bristol music label Multiverse on the audiovisual label Mixmash. So here I basically made about a dozen videos for tracks that the music producers could use as custom content in their tour. I could also play them within my AV performances and of course we could also play together depending on the circumstances we could play as a team so it became kind of a shared content for distributed and multiple kinds of uses. I also invited musicians to work on bigger projects like with Dan Tate when we co-produced a live film remix of George Lucas's first feature film THX 1138 so fast forward to 2010, for many reasons, I thought I did what I needed to do in the VJ world. 
I needed to move away from London because I was longing to go back to Montreal. So that's what I did. But during this transition, I also moved away from the artist name DJ Anyone. This is the name I had when I was doing AV performances. I wanted to go closer to my original name by, by choosing Oli Sorensen. And in this transition, in the change of names and locations, my practice also migrated back from being shown in clubs and festivals to more art-specific venues. A good example of this transition of, of my work is with the series called No More Heroes, which I initiated with Juno Boyle in the UK. This was uh, first shown in uh, cinema venues and cinema festivals. But then the same series morphed into uh, poster art and video installations that I could show in, in art venues. The process of this series involved, like the title says, to remove the hero out of the mainstream Hollywood films, which most often these films featured a white man uh, as the main protagonist. So when you take, for example, Keanu Reeves out of the Matrix, all the scenes where you can hear and see him are removed. And so the uh, supporting actors, so played by Lawrence Fishburne and Carrie Ann Moss, suddenly they add much more diversity to an original conventional science fiction movie. So I remixed many films this way. I remixed Taxi Driver, I remixed Rocky, and so on. But then I wanted to take things one step further. So a few years later, I decided to do the same process but with all 24 official James Bond movies. I wanted to um, remove the actors that played James Bond, so Sean Connery, Roger Moore, Daniel Craig, so on, and present these all together in a monumental video installation. So the only elements remaining, when you take out this character, which is almost always on screen, very little fragments are remaining, but they consist uh, essentially in sexy girls, evil geniuses, henchmen, gadgets, fast cars, explosions. These are all the accessories that you commonly see in the James Bond franchise. Then to continue my foray a bit deeper into art galleries, I progressively took the narrative components out of my video installations to make them a bit more open-ended in terms of meaning. So the horizontal lines you see here were inspired by Daniel Buren's vertical lines. So instead of sampling from pop culture and cinema, here I started sampling directly from contemporary art culture. I was remixing the visual signature of an established artist and applying it to another medium or technique that the original artist never used. The technique I used here was of a video mapping which I also modified from its uh, traditional use to suit my own practice. When artists like 1024 or Joanie Le Mercier pioneered the video mapping technique as a form of expression, they projected on a relatively flat architectural surface to produce illusions of movements and volumes moving in a simulated 3D space. But in my case, I projected really flat videos without any illusions of depth so Daniel Buren's stripes, I projected these not on flat surfaces, but on volumes in a real physical space. Behind this projection are the same shapes as in the previous slide, and the flat lines in the video get distorted on the volumes. So my remixing of Buren and the video mapping, there is a sort of inversion between real and illusionary space. Here's another example of the same series, projecting Buren's lines on simple shapes in a corner between two gallery walls. After remixing Buren's iconography, I turned to Michelangelo Pistoletto's work in Arte Povera, particularly with his series of broken mirrors. I remixed this uh, performance gesture of breaking mirrors to instead break LCD television screens, but to show some continuity with uh, the previous series. I also started my performances with the stripes that reminded of Buren. Using a hammer and chisel, tools normally used for sculpting stone, 
I applied these tools for breaking TVs in creative ways. This breaking gesture was delivered as an art performance in front of a live audience. So again, as with Mapping Buren, I remixed an established artist's signature move and applied it onto a material that the original artist so far never used. In this series, I find that not only is Pistoletto's individual work being remixed, but also the entire movement of Arte Povera is uh, revisited because, uh, to my knowledge, no Arte Povera artist has used media or technology as a means of expression, and through planned obsolescence, no other material in the 21st century, I find, is destined to degrade and become poorer than aging technology. Also, when breaking the LCD screens, I create these lovely glitch patterns which make the medium suddenly emerge to the viewer's conscience where we can no longer ignore the technology of the screen and devote our attention to the, the content being broadcast. So in losing its main function of a window to the world, bringing news and entertainment, the TVs become a visible object again in its own concrete terms. My next series was uh, triggered by Michael Wolff's uh, photographic series entitled Real Fake Art, where he took pictures of copy artists in the Chinese town of Dafen in Shenzhen, which I found fascinating in regards to copyright issues. It's the heated topic in the world of uh, remix art, but the portraits are problematic at the same time because these uh, painters are framed in Wolff's picture as almost as ethnographical portraits, as if Wolf was some kind of an anthropologist looking down on tribesmen painters who usually do cooking and cleaning for a living as evidence in the outdoor shots here so obviously stage uh, next to mops and curing meats next to the artists so why are, are they not portrayed inside their studios why are their pictures staged outside and not inside the studios in reaction to wolf's series but also in reaction to the greater phenomenon of uh, copy art in China, I was inspired to produce my next series entitled Fontana Mashup. A mashup, in case you don't know, is a variant of a remix, where instead of altering one image by one author, I combine two works from completely different origins. But again, the mashup was done here using techniques not used by the original artists that I sampled. I contacted some of the Dathan painters directly through the magic of global online communication and commissioned a few of them to reproduce some of the most iconic modern paintings currently breaking records at auction houses like Sotheby's and Christie's. On top of these copied oil paintings, I would also add Lucio Fontana's incisions that he created in the 1950s on monochrome canvases. And this is where the mashup occurred between Fontana's cuts faithfully reproduced on a series of fake modern paintings and also by choosing artists like Warhol, I added an extra twist to the series, in fact questioning whether the original artists themselves did produce their own work since it's well known that Warhol famously worked with many assistants. And when I moved on to older works like this copy of a Rembrandt, the artist's input is equally questioned since it's well documented that he also hired a wide range of artisans in his painter's atelier. The Fontana incisions are not rendered randomly or violently, but actually quite slowly and as faithfully as possible. Sometimes with the Rembrandt in the middle here, the patterns of cuts are rotated 90 degrees to better fit the background image. But as far as I know, Fontana never cut his canvases in the context of a live performance. Uh, these were always done on blank or monochrome surfaces. So the series does move quite far away from Fontana's initial oeuvre. I did allow myself a few liberties in later iterations of the series, like uh, rotating the patterns of cuts. But as I was trying to figure out a way to widen the gaps in Fontana's incisions, I started using sponges to temporarily accentuate the openings I created, but then I found the colorful squares of the sponges added a much needed contrast to the entire composition, as well as a sense of uh, descent, a break in the decorum of the original works, 
which I really liked, so I eventually kept the sponges in this final piece, citing Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi, which I think is still the highest selling work in an auction. It sold at around $450 million. Okay, I could show you more work because I'm always exploring new directions. Um, I'm in the process of new work at the moment, but I'm going to stop here so we can discuss some of the underlying concepts in my practice. It's pretty common in remix art in general. So firstly, this culture of remixing questions the differences between creating from scratch, out of nothing, and creating original works out of already existing contents. Here we can start by asking if it's even possible to create something totally new today in a world where seemingly everything has been done before. We can also position remix practices in the context of social networking, where on a daily basis, countless numbers of images are being shared casually among friends just to say, look what I found. Hey, this is funny or sad or shocking. So this is a much wider scope than just saying, this is mine. In creative terms, you're not only saying, I made this and only I can use this, own it, distribute it, or make money from it. This proprietary model still exists and is going strong in the business world. Even in the digital industries where you can't resell music or software, or even worse now, in the agricultural industry, you can't resell seeds. Seeds are being copyrighted. How does art and life relate then? How does art making only cater for proprietary markets? Nina Paley is an animator which I think really nailed this idea of collective memory and the contrast between sharing cultures and proprietary industries. When she highlighted in her animations that we're bombarded on a daily basis with advertising and all sorts of memes and other mediated contents that occupy our brain, which is part of our body, and if through copyright laws we're withheld from sharing or disposing of the contents of our minds, as a result, we no longer own those parts of our minds and our bodies. In this sense, for her, sharing the content of our psyche with others is essential to um, creating and maintaining communities, but more importantly, it's a sign that we're still sovereign within our own bodies. So in other words, the idea that we still own our minds is demonstrated by the fact that we can still share its contents. Another key reference to know more about remix art is Kirby Ferguson's documentary called Everything is a Remix because he defines remixing not only as the act of copying, but also as transforming and combining these copies to generate something that was not there before. In this sense, according to Ferguson, everything becomes a remix, and this act can be seen everywhere and has been present for a long time. Countless more subtle interactions between artworks of different times and different artists can very well recall the gestures of remix art. In examples like those shown here, you can even lose sense of which is an original or which one is a copy, which one came first. These ideas become circular, it becomes a chicken and egg question, and the common patterns found in many works actually emerge as something else, and we instead start talking about art movements and cultural zeitgeist, signs of the time, and so on. So really, when we talk about remixing, it's clear to me that we're not talking about plagiarism or counterfeiting. Plagiarism is when an author claims, I did this and not someone else, when all they did was to replace their signature with the original creator's name. That's not what I'm condoning here. Counterfeiting is the opposite, when an author claims someone else did this and not me, when a creator produces a completely new work in the manner of a famous artist and instead of selling their own work under their own name, they sell it for more money often under the guise of another author. Again, remix art is not about that. It's about maintaining the presence of two authors or more on the same work. One artist might have done their part in a first instance, then another added more elements or even removed some. But in the end, we can trace back both of these inputs to simultaneous presence. And this is exactly what is enjoyable and valuable in remix art. With this in mind, 
we can of course go back to remix music and the popular uses of the term remix, but when applied to visual arts, entire sections and movements can be identified to the gestures of remixing. One of my favorite examples is by the Chapman brothers who in 2001 bought original etchings of Francisco Goya's 1937 series entitled Disasters of War. They transformed his austere prints into kitsch and absurd works by drawing directly on the etching and renaming them Insult to Injury. I like also that the resulting work mixes uneasy feelings of indignation and bad taste when altering uh, such famous works, adding dark humor when summoning such a controversial event as the Napoleonic War in Spain. But it also forces us to raise important questions about what it means to be an author in the 21st century, where so much content is available to us and why we should use or not use this content as a primary creative material. And once we said that, other forms of human activities can actually be considered as artistic creations. Penelope Umbrico's act of collecting sunsets from Flickr becomes artistic in this context. It's remixed not by changing one individual sunset, but in combining other works together. And Umbrico's work, in this case, is not static, but evolves as she continues over the years to collect more and more images from Flickr. And interestingly, the assembly of sunset is never exhibited in its entirety, as the numbers of individual images become much too large to display at once, and they can only be understood in the compressed spaces of online databases. Going back to Kirby Ferguson's basic definition of remixing, to remind everyone that this act expands from the simple act of copying, to also incorporate transformations, as we saw in the Chapman Brothers' changing of Goya etchings, and combinations, as we saw in Umbrico's accumulations of sunsets. And in my own work, I often say that I combine original sequences of unoriginal building blocks. In this sense, the originality or authenticity or uniqueness of creators using such means must be found elsewhere than in the act of creating from scratch or making something totally new. This is becoming exceptionally rare, if not impossible to do in the world we live in, a world of overabundant content coming from every place in the world and every time in the past, all the works of art history seem equally available by a simple online Google search. To close, I want to ask a question about larger contexts of human activities that go beyond the realm of artistic creation. So where can we see signs of remixing in everyday non-artistic markets? One obvious answer will be in the globalized manufacturers when companies like Apple delegate or outsource much of their labor to third parties in China or other places. And as we can see in the back of my iPhone, where it says designed in California, assembled in China, this I find relates closely to the acts of remixing, not only copying, but combining and transforming. Delegating is something we can tie into that as well. So like in the past, in the painter's atelier, where teams of artisans work together to make a work that is signed by a single master painter, vast numbers of workshops across the planet are now together authoring the, the consumer items of our daily lives. Gone are the days where products were conceived and fabricated by one person or one company, so the ways of working of remix artists are acceptable to us because these are also the ways of working for most industries, sharing and delegating, co-authoring, upgrading and adding to the existing accumulations of materials, objects, products and services that make up our daily lives. All right, that's all I wanted to say for now. I hope this video helped you to better understand Remix culture and also my work in the process. Don't hesitate to ask me any questions in the comments below. Check out my other stuff on YouTube and subscribe if you want to be notified of my new uploads coming and perhaps I'll see you very soon. Take care in the meantime.